how you feel the U.S. is placed in the Pacific um, amid, you know, all the political um, climate back in the U.S. You know, how has this visit to the Pacific Island um, given you a perspective of, you know, how the U.S. is, is viewed uh, regionally? Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, there's been a lot of discussion about what uh, the U.S.'s position is in the Asia-Pacific with the change of government in the U.S. and amid um, sort of the rise of, I think, Chinese economic power in the region, but also um, sort of the growing, um, you know, multipolarity, other powers being involved in the region. And what I, I think, have been able to sort of reaffirm by coming out here and also what I've picked up by people that I've talked to um, is that basically the U.S. is going to remain <clears throat> very much engaged in this region. Um, I mean, we are a Pacific power. We have a long history with a lot of the peoples uh, and states in this region. And uh, we uh, feel that we are devoting a lot of continued energy and effort uh, in the region. We've certainly seen the uh, administration, the new Trump administration, devoting a lot of time and energy to Asia Pacific issues, uh, but also um, to putting a lot of emphasis on engagement with uh, states all over the Asia Pacific region. We've had to spend a lot of time, it's true, on issues in Northeast Asia with the North Korea crisis. But um, beyond that, you know, the Secretary of State has traveled out to Australia and New Zealand. Um, in doing so, we had a chance to stop off in Guam. We had a chance to stop off in American Samoa, and these are American territories, of course, but it definitely gives you the perspective of um, island peoples in the region. And I think there's been a lot of uh, discussion about uh, sort of the priorities of the administration. And um, I think the one thing I've been able to share with people is that we continue to very much prioritize peace and prosperity in the Asia Pacific region. It's really suited all of the countries in the region well developmentally. And we see the Asia Pacific, um, including the Pacific, as a very dynamic economic region and key to the future of the United States. So I don't think it's, um, reasonable to think that any U.S. administration, including the present U.S. administration, could by any means uh, be retreating from Asia or disengaging from Asia. This is kind of a key area for our future. And I understand your specialty or, uh, is about foreign policy, so you know, I'm curious as to your perspective on the approaches, um, the different approaches between China and the U.S. and how hmm. you feel um, you know, the, the type of approach can be shifted, or is there a view from the U.S. to shift its approach um, in the Pacific, um, seeing the, you know, the obvious growth of the China, of Chinese influence in the Pacific? Well, I think what we have always liked to stress is um, deep kind of people-to-people -people ties, shared values surrounding, um, you know, sovereignty, freedom to make one's own choices, democracy, um, equality, and respect for all of those values. And I think what we find when we travel around the Pacific is that those kinds of bedrock kind of values are very important to people in the Pacific. Um, certainly, I think um, the U.S. is seen as a valued and trusted partner that brings high quality, that brings uh, you know, genuine engagement and respect for culture, for the sovereignty of the countries in the region, and that stands for sort of rules-based, high standards, good governance, and high quality. And so I think those are the things that we continue to stress in the region. Uh, I think the U.S. is regarded as a deliverer of those kinds of uh, um, you know, values, and that will uh, continue to stress that. I don't. I don't really see us as being in some kind of a competition with China in the region. Of course, you know, China is a rising power. Its interests are expanding. It has um, a lot of ties in this area, uh, some of which go back, you know, decades, if not centuries. And um, it's only natural that, you know, their businesses and companies are going to be expanding their interests, looking for opportunities, and that countries in the region would want to take advantage of some of those opportunities. But I think what we would uh, stress is that 
you know, whatever comes for the people of the Pacific, they um, should, um, you know, be transparent about sort of what's, what these opportunities are about and should respect, um, you know, culture, independence, sovereignty, et cetera, and deliver high quality and good governance aspects of those projects as well. Thank you. I think that really wraps it up. <laughs> um, just as you speak on the issue of sovereignty, um, it gets me to the point of state sovereignty. And uh, an issue that's quite pertinent in discussions among Pacific leaders, especially under the climate change negotiations and, um, and the recent UN Oceans Conference in New York, is this issue of uh, state sovereignty, the threat to state sovereignty due to land loss as a result of climate change and the intrinsic link to oceans. Um, and I am curious as to your views on the fact that, um, you know, the U.S. is still behind on the ratification of um, the United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea. And what does this say about the U.S. commitment to the most vulnerable islands in the Pacific who will be impacted as a result of, you know, some of the um, negotiations under this particular convention? Yeah, so I think... Um I mean, you raised two issues. One is the, the unclosed ratification, another one, the Paris Climate Change Agreement. And these are issues that are quite controversial in the U.S. and have been for, for decades. I'm talking about the U.N. Um, uh, Convention on the Law of the Sea uh, because the Paris Climate Agreement is more recent. But it's also been controversial since, you know, the inception of the Kyoto Agreement, et cetera. And most of the controversy comes from sort of purely U.S. domestic issues, which is the role of the federal government versus the state and the role of the government versus the private sector, et cetera, and, um, you know, how um, sort of international agreements impinge on sovereignty. And there are different camps in the U.S. on all of these issues. But I think what uh, I would like to stress is that under both of these agreements, the Paris Climate Change Agreement and the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, what we have seen and what we have practiced is really um, uh, a commitment, even though we haven't ratified, to abide by um, the Convention on the Law of the Sea, for example. And we have adopted the UNCLOSE as the customary maritime law. and. Um, you know, our Navy certainly practices it and has adopted it as their own rule of law. So um, despite the uh, kind of inability of um, the politics at the macro level to get in order and come behind it, um, the practitioners and all of the people who are sort of affected by this have been, um, you know, sort of following the the convention um, in very intricate ways ever since its adoption by uh, the international community. And I think on the Paris Climate Change Agreement, similarly, there's a lot of controversies over the details about the, the, the framework agreement and how we'll proceed with that. But in essence, you know, what you see is a commitment on the part, I think, of the American people, on the part of American um, sort of organizations and subnational levels and even the national level to continue with commitments to reduce greenhouse gases as we have been doing and to um, try to you know promote best practices and uh, make it possible for all countries to continue to grow their economies while reducing greenhouse gases. So I think the contributions that we make will still continue to be very major and very significant. And, you know, the details of what happens with the agreement is uh, still a little bit unclear, but I think our leadership will continue. And we think that this is a very compelling and important issue, obviously, for the states in this region and understand that they feel challenged by it. So I think we'll keep you know, working together on, on those issues and having programs in the region to, to help with um, mitigation, adaptation, et cetera. And you've, you know, you've been in the region for a few weeks now. Yeah, or, yeah. So have you seen direct impacts of climate change in your travels? Well, I know that a number of the Pacific Island leaders have talked about um, you know, some of the, for example, weather issues um, that they attribute to climate change. I mean, I think it's 
Um, it's difficult to know. They, they have also talked to me about um, recent weather events in the United States. And of course, we're watching another um, weather event happening right now. Um, so I think it's, you know, it's hard to say exactly what you could attribute, but certainly there's a high, high level of concern. And there are changes that have been, you know, uh, seen and, and documented in weather patterns that people are attributing to this. So I think, you know, whether it be the reconstruction of a seawall, um, obviously there are weather events uh, in this area dating way, way, way back. So it's hard to know exactly what to attribute, but I think um, there's definitely a lot of concern and about the future, sort of what will happen. Um, we also talked a lot this week about uh, maritime environment conservation sustainability and in particular to this region of course is the issue of fisheries and I think uh, you know there are questions I don't know if any of them have really been answered yet but about what the effects of climate might be on some of those issues as well um, you know there's a lot of initiatives that the US has supported in the Pacific region on sustainable fisheries right um, can you highlight some of the key well, I think probably one of the um, the biggest, um, uh, highest profile that's well known to many of the uh, of the uh, economies in the Pacific is the is the tuna treaty, so called, which provides you know a, a regula regulatory framework for fishing for tuna, and many of the islands um, get much of their livelihood from the from the tuna industry, and that's a way that we've kind of. Uh, provided a framework for U.S. tuna fisheries to, um, you know, cooperate in a in a way that's very regulated with the local islands to, you know, supply uh, tuna to canneries and also to provide livelihood and, and payments for the rights to fish in those areas. So I think that um, is a very high profile agreement that has been reached that a lot of people are familiar with and has been recently extended. I think last year. Um, but we have a lot of other programs that we're working on, um, a lot of things having to do with enforcement of um, sort of uh, oceans regulations with regard to, you know, everything from trafficking to illegal fishing. Uh, we have a ship rider program with our Coast Guard, which takes many of the participants from Pacific Islands on board our Coast Guard ships to do enforcement, to look for bad guys out there on the ocean and um, try to make sure that Pacific Islands know what's going on in their ocean environment. I mean, they ha they're responsible for a lot more ocean most of the time than they are land. And uh, it's tough. It's tough. So we try to provide some capacity building programs and also, you know, practical um, kinds of exercises and uh, training programs, but also just practical kind of ride along and enforce. And I think that's also very important. I've had the pleasure of being on one of the NOAA um, oh. vessels, and they showed us their most recent, because they send the, uh, you know, the camera, the mobile camera. Down below the... Down and they showed us some new species they discovered really? on their way to Samoa. And, and it was like this really freaky looking kind of like, um, it was almost like a cartoonish, but it was very interesting because it was, we've never seen it before. And they wow. said that was the first time they've come across it. Um, was it in so a very deep trench or very something? Deep, oh, yeah, really? Yeah, they send the, what's the, the name of the, very like expensive. a bathysphere they yeah. send down or something, yeah. <laughs> but it was fascinating knowing yeah. that, you know, just here in our own, very own marine environment that it's so rich and so diverse and yeah. there's so much we don't know. Right. You know, and so that was very useful for us and we took some students on board. And Great. And they were fascinated by it. Um, well, education yeah. is so important and I think education in the sciences is, is crucial and, um, you know, we've, these kind of people-to-people -people exchanges that we have with the islands are also crucially important. There's so many people that come to the U.S. and, and or, or go to Australia and New Zealand, come back to the islands, and, um, you know, it's a very sort of enriching environment for, for both, both cultures, and I think, you know, we'll certainly expect to see that continue and, um, and look forward to it, so... Yeah. It's been it's been very good here. Mm -hmm. we, we always get those opportunities, and we also go see the when the U.S. Coast Guard arrives. Mm -hmm. you know, we get some students up there. Too. Oh, that's and, great. You know, there's 
when they go up there, they're like, oh my god, it's like being in the movies, you know, because it's so different to, yeah. to what we know. So I think just um, just on that and on the value of, you know, of our marine environment, sustainable fisheries, and just in light of conservation efforts around the region, I mean, there's this issue of monuments, um, um, especially in Hawaii and mm. Samoa, very mm. much part of the Pacific. Mm. Um, you know, right, in of course. Of the Pacific. Right. Um, so... You know, what can you say about the political decisions that might affect the, you know, the, the safety or rather the preservation of these key biodiversity areas for the Pacific? Um, well, I know that, um, you know, there's been a lot of efforts undertaken to continue to expand and, and um, prolong the sort of efforts to preserve some of these major areas. Um, you know, I think that that is still under review and consideration by the current administration, and the, certainly the last administration really did um, expand the amount of space under preservation um, by a huge amount. Um, and it's not just in the Pacific. I mean, we're working on preservation of marine environments in the Arctic, in the Antarctic, and this is all, since the oceans are all connected, I think it's all very important. Um, I mean, I think these efforts on preservation will certainly continue. Um, how much of it is going to be done at the, again, the national level versus other levels, um, I think we'll have to see going forward. But I, I wouldn't um, expect the U.S. to sort of shrink away from these efforts to continue to expand. And we have, you know, a very expansive national park system and a lot of, of conservation efforts always ongoing. And so I think, you know, there's a lot of grassroots impetus behind these kinds of things in the U.S. So I would, I would expect to see this kind of thing continue. Mm -hmm. I think my final question is, you know, the, the, the theme was Blue Pacific. Right. Blue Pacific and the Disney theme. Um, what do you think of this concept of big ocean states? Um, big ocean Pacific. states. Like we're we're ocean states as opposed to land so states. Developing yeah. Countries. Um. Well, there was a lot of discussion about, and and you know it's interesting because different states have disparate, um, very disparate kind of EEZs or areas of the Blue Pacific that they're responsible for. So, some of the smaller island states have the biggest. Uh, sort of blue areas of responsibility, and um, it's a, uh, you know, I think it's actually a very compelling and modern kind of way of looking at things. Mm. Um, you know, you see as the world becomes more and more interconnected that state responsibilities, you know, many many times are are extending beyond their traditional land borders. And this gets to sort of migration of people, um, issues with pollution, uh, responsibilities of transnational corporations, et cetera. And so I think thinking about your responsibilities as extending farther is um, probably a trend of the future. And so I think this is probably very cutting edge. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Yeah.